Hoops Heaven proudly brings to you Basketball Hustle, featuring your host, the writer, Chris Pike, and the scoring machine, Sean Redditch. Now it's time for another episode of Hoops Heaven's Basketball Hustle. Okay, back here on Hoop Seven's Basketball Hustle, and as we keep talking about Sean, every 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 week we keep doing a show. It might be the NBL off season, but there's no shortage of things to talk about, and, and that's because of people like our our next guest. He's he's put together a hell of a good NBL career at the Illawarra Hawks, and and full credit to him for playing all 310 games at the Hawks ever since he came came back to Australia out of college. Um, I've seen that whole career, and so have you, Sean. You've played against him for a lot of those games, including two Grand Final series and a couple of other playoff series as well. So that's get straight to it. Tim Conrad, thanks very much for joining us. How are you guys? No, thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Tim. No, it's um, it's great to, to have you on the show. I think, uh, you know, a lot of uh, admiration from, from my part on your game and what you've been able to uh, do in your career, especially, you, uh, you know, just the loyalty you've had to Illawarra and, and stayed there. Just give us a little background about yourself and your career. Obviously, you grew up in Brisbane. Um, tell, t- talk to us about college life, and then what was the decision coming back to the NBL like? Yeah, like I was, um, I was never very highly recruited uh, uh, at any stage of my life. So um, I had to, uh, I, I got knocked back a lot of times for college. Um, I think I applied for about a dozen schools and got a rejection letter from all dozen. So it took me a while to finally get in. Um, but when I did, it was a good experience. I went to a school in Florida, uh, Nova Southeastern, for the four-year starter at a Division II school. So that was good. Um, taught me a lot. Uh, coming back from, from that into NBL, I was just trying to uh, to get a team to, to fly me out and practice. Um, I spoke with, uh, I remember my first uh, when I first spoke to a uh, NBL coach, it was Aaron Fern at Cairns. My agent said he was going to give me a call. And um, I'm like, oh, sweet, man, here we go. I might be able to go up there and, you know, try out so to speak or you know whatever happens and then what well, wasn't the case Aaron I think Aaron spent half an hour telling me how I wasn't ready to play in the NBL <laughs> <laughs> so it was, um, uh, it was a little, a little uh, disconcerting and I was getting ready to actually enter the workforce when um, my agent uh, got me uh, a trial with Illawarra uh, they didn't really want to take me at first but I said I'd fly myself up and find my own you know place to stay and just wanted to practice with the team for a few weeks and so I got to meet you know uh, Sav and Campbell and you know got to train with them for a week and I had a really good week of training yeah, and I think that, that just impressed the right people and uh, that was that I've been there ever since yeah, I just okay. remember the first um, time in the preseason was it up in uh, was your first preseason games up in Darwin in the preseason blitz and you had something That's like right. 30 or 40 points in a game and everyone was like who's who's this guy coming out of nowhere <laughs> uh, you know looking uh, at your school and we're like division two and he's coming back dropping 40 in a, in a preseason <laughs> game uh, no, I don't think it was 40. I was like, oh, we'll take it. Um, now, nah, look, what happened was we had three games in Darwin. I do remember this. Um, I had a really good first game. I think I had 20 something. Um, it was, uh, against the Breakers at the time. And then we played the Gold Coast in the second lane. I had a donut. <laughs> 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 so it was, uh, the up and downs of being a rookie, I suppose. But, um, no, look, I had a lot of good, good guys team. And obviously I was playing behind Stab at the time. And, um, uh, obviously, and Campbell as well. I learned a lot of a lot of things. But one of the main things I learned was what it takes to be a professional. You know, like the, the time you've got to put in. And I was always a fairly hard worker. But then you throw the uh, you know the, the the way that those guys approach the game and, and the amount of reps they got up and just you know tried to perfect their craft. And I think that I think that really spoke to me. And I was lucky to have those guys in those early years. Amazing to think that Fernie thought you weren't ready to play for that rookie season because I guess if it wasn't for Jesse Wagstaff, you would have got Rookie of the Year that, that season. Um, from memory, you were clearly the top two rookies that season. And then come the grand final series, even though you lost to, to the Wildcats, you know, I think you were, you were the Hawks' best player across those, those three games. So I think you, you well and truly showed that you were ready to play once you did come back from college. Yeah, I mean, Jesse's, Jesse's a great talent as well. I, I... Yeah, he definitely deserved rookie of the year. His numbers were better than mine. I had a final series, yeah, but um, yeah. at the end of the day, he, he performed much better over the season, I, I felt, anyway. Um, but, you know, it was, uh, 
it was a really good experience that first year. You know, we were we were picked to come last, I remember. Mm. But um, uh, we ran into a, uh, a Wildcat team that were just the benchmark for the whole season. You know, that's uh, I think that's uh, from memory, Sean. I think in that, in that same Darwin tournament, people were talking about Kevin Lish was about to be fired, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, it was early in the season. It didn't take long. It was early, actually. Um, yeah, they uh, didn't have a great first game. And I think we might have started 0-2 that year, and we Kev hit the game winner against Townsville. That's right. Up in Townsville right. that kind of, I guess, got us our season going a little bit. But it's, there's so many little things like that in, in people's careers that, to me, is always fascinating. Just hearing your story, uh, you know, I never heard that about, you know, talking to Fern. Um, you know, obviously Kevin Lish um, potentially getting fired, and we had um, we had Cam Glidden on the show the other day, and, and I asked him his two toughest players, and he said, uh, you know, Bryce Cotton and, and Kevin Lish in in mm-hmm. his prime as well. So it's uh, you know, basketball is a funny little thing where just getting those right opportunities and just making the most of it, um, and sometimes getting a little rejection is probably not a a bad thing in that it kind of makes you motivated and a little bit more uh, appreciative next time you get those opportunities. It certainly happened with me um, with the breakers, and it sounds like some of those same things. But probably, uh, do you look back on that now and say maybe that was one of the things that actually has helped me have such a, a long and successful career in the NBA? Yeah, I mean, uh, from, an early, from an early standpoint, I, I, was, uh, I was never really – you know, the the high recruit in my year, you know, I, I didn't make the AIS. You know, they would go to the chute and do your thing. I was rejected from that. You know, it took me ages to get into college and a lot of rejection there. I was never really very good at basketball until I was probably like 16, 17. Around there, I started to turn the corner. Yeah, I just, I've had to deal with a lot of being knocked back. But I think when you look back at it, it you can go one or two ways. You know, you can take it as motivation or you can just, you can crumble, you know, and um, and go someplace else. But you know, I, I always loved basketball and I stuck with it. You know, I was able to grind out a pretty good co- uh, college career individually. And, um, you know, I just, it, for my whole season, it just took, it just took people to see me in person. Like it, or it just took me to, to go there and just show what I could do in person. And if I sent tapes out or I had to try and talk my way into a position, I was never very good at it. I just I always let my actions do the talking. That's why I'm not really a big talker at practice. I don't like, I'm not the guy that's going to call someone out in front of someone. And then, you know, that's just not me. I've tried to do that before in the past and it's not me, you know. So I'm more of a uh, let my actions do the talking sort of person. And, you know, I just, I've always just tried to play that way. And um, I've never really wanted to get into trash talking because whenever I start trash talking, my game goes downward. <laughs> so I've, <laughs> I've figured that out the hard way. <laughs> Talk about how nothing's ever come easily, and we can circle back to your embryo career as well, so I'm not skipping skipping over it, but one of my favourite, I guess, chats and stories I ended up doing was when I got to speak to you about how much it meant to you to finally get to play for the Boomers. It must have been, you were 31 or 32, you'd been you'd played in the NBL for 10 years, and you, you had accepted the fact that your chance to probably play for Australia was over, but you know, you just stuck at it, you persevered, and when the phone call came, you were willing to take it, and I think it was the Iran trip in the end, and and it wasn't it wasn't the most glamorous trip that you ended up taking, but you know the fact that you got to play for the Boomers was you know, and the fact that I got to help you tell that story was one of my my highlights, and for you it it just shows that perseverance obviously pays off. Yeah, look, that was that was obviously pretty special for me. I mean, Sean's pulled on the green and gold before. You know exactly mm-hmm. what it's like. It's a little inside story from that that kind of trip uh, I, I developed a, a tremendous amount of respect for Mitch Creek in that mm. in that trip just because purely there were some guys that turned down the, the opportunity to go even though they weren't yeah. playing um, and to me in my position you know I, maybe it's a different position for them but for my position the minute you start turning down the green and gold it starts losing its flavour and you never want to you represent your country is for me is just the tippy top you know, there's nothing better than that and when I heard that some guys were like, I don't want to go to Kazakhstan and Iran, it doesn't, games don't mean anything. I'm like, you're playing for you, playing for your country. It, it means something, you know, like, uh, I just, I just can't, I know there's different, I'm not naive and I think that NBA guys can come in every time. I get mm-hmm. that they've got a bigger, they've got bigger, you know, I'm talking about NBL guys here who, who didn't have obligations anywhere else. And, yep. you know, for me, that's just, that's crazy. I don't, you know, I, like, I think Creaky said it doesn't matter to him when he got the call, he was there. You know, he had things going on in the background. He was NBA prospects, and he still came. So I was just, 
I just developed a lot of respect for him just for doing that and some of the stuff that he said, you know. And for me, it doesn't matter where it was. We could have been playing on the moon. I still would have done it, you know. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it was, I remember when I was Bradkey and, and Luke Longley gave me my, my green and gold. I, I cried. I'm not going to lie. Mm. I, uh, <laughs> just being able to be around some guys like that and seeing how they operate and talk to them about stuff they've done before. So it was a great experience for me. And, um, yeah, I'll never forget that. Since then as well, you've also got to play three on three basketball as well. And I remember speaking to you about, about that. You were willing to give it a crack for the first time and it ended up leading to, to some good times as well, playing for your country in, in the green and gold. And, you know, you yourself and Greg Heyer and, 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 and company have, have had some good success at that too. Yeah, it's, uh, I love that format. Like, uh, I really did fall in love with it you know, the first time I started playing. Um, it's, uh, it suits me a little bit better. I don't have to be as fast, which is good. <laughs> it's more of a, uh, it's more of a physical, um, you know, you don't have to be as quick because the physicality just doesn't really allow for too much quickness. You know, you're not running in transition, you're not sprinting. You know, when guys drive, you can be a lot more aggressive. So speed kind of gets taken out of it to a degree. Um, but yeah, and, and like, but the feeling within the group, it's a small four man group, you know, and, um, mm. it's really tight knit. So, you know, when we went away and when we qualified for the World Cup, it was, a, it was an awesome experience because that was a grind against some really good teams. And then we went away to the Asia Cup and, and ended up winning that. Um, and it's, it's, it was just a really cool experience. And we went to the, uh, we went to the World Cup and we got out. And we had, unfortunately, we had some powerhouses in our pool and didn't get out of uh, pool play. But I mean, the experience and just seeing on what level some of those guys were on and, and what it takes is was really, was really special. And again, you know, representing your country and, and being able to um, to pull on the green and gold, uh, you know, I'm all for just more opportunities to do that. Is there, you know, in the future, do you see yourself, you know, getting more involved in the three on three and and do you, uh, I guess, where do you see that going, you know, two, three years down the track here in Australia and worldwide as well? Well, I mean, uh, actually, I was just speaking to Greg High about this as well. Um, obviously, we're trying to grow the sport, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it also does come down to a funding thing. And, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, I'm, I'm actually trying to chat to some people now and find out why, but we, Basketball Australia, is not sending us back to the Asia Cup. So... Mm-hmm. Apparently the funding's not there or, or whatever it is, but now they've brought in a new rule. FIBA brought in a new rule. You win the Asia Cup, you get an automatic bid to the World Cup. So that's a that's a really good pathway for us to take. But only if we're in the Asia Cup. I mean, we've won it two times in a row now, you know. And um, to not send us back when the sport's on the rise, you know, this is an Olympic sport now. This isn't yeah. just some streetball thing that I think some people still associate it with. This is an Olympic sport. Why are we not putting and time and effort into it is uh, is beyond me. And, um, you know, I mean, essentially they're taking away uh, by not, you know, they're taking away the opportunity for Australians like me and Greg who probably wouldn't have, a don't, uh, probably is the wrong word, don't have the opportunity to play at the Olympics. Uh, five and five, this is a chance for us to represent Australia at the Olympics, which is, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, you know. So, um you know, it's uh, for me, it's quite an emotional thing when you hear that we're not going to give the funding that's required to go and do that. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to rectify that. Hopefully, we can get back there. But um, it was pretty disconcerting when I found that news out. That's that's remarkable. that is disconcerting. I mean, sorry, Pikey, but um, just going going into that because I see I'm I'm now doing a lot of coaching, got a lot of junior kids. I see three on three as a great development tool um for mm-hmm. kids because you know when you're when you're 12 years old, you got a an outstanding player. He gets the ball, he goes dribbles down the court, he makes a great move, scores. The other four players have not done anything with, they haven't really had to do a whole lot. So, you know, a lot of my trainings, I'm starting to add a lot of three on three into it because there's so much decision making. Um, I think you're going to become a better basketball player long term. And if these, these players can also look at three on three and see, you know, Greg Hart, Tim Conrad going to the World Cup, going to the Olympics and see pathways from that, I think it's uh, an exciting way for basketball to improve in this country over over that as well how do you see that yeah no i I would totally agree with you like and a lot of this uh you know what what i love about 3x3 is you can't hide you know a lot of times myself in my position you know a lot of plays my job is to stretch the floor on offense you know go stand in the corner make sure no one can help off you if they help you knock down a shot you know and that's that's part of my position i'm not you know if that's if that's what it is then that's what it is you know that's my job 
But in a three x three situation, you can't hide. You have to be doing something every possession. You know, it's um, it's just real involvement, and um, I like I like the physicality of it as well. I think I think one of the things that I never learned uh, at an earlier age how to how to deal with contact. Um, I was actually speaking to someone about this on another podcast. We we're talking about designing a perfect basketball player. And I said um, that if I had the choice, I'd have to play Aussie rules football from a young age as well as basketball because some of the skills in that transfer really well. You're not only learning to develop your ends because you're running like crazy. You're learning how to handle contact. Sure. You're learning, you know, 360 uh, awareness. You're not just moving forwards and backwards, jumping. You know, you're sprinting. There's a lot of skills that are mm. transferable. And I think for me, what I didn't get at the young age is the contact side. You look at someone like a, you know, well, I mean, Probably a good example is Craig Molly, his nose for the ball. You know, that's probably developed from an AFL standpoint. You know, some guys that, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Nick Cave was in, was in the footy. Can't remember. But guys like that who have a great nose for the ball, you know, sometimes have grown up playing footy. And I think that's just like to talk about, um, I never learned how to deal with physicality. 3x3 three is three an area where I've been able to, I've had to deal with it now. And I think it's going to make me better in the long term. If I had started playing 3x3 three three from a younger age, then I think my ability to get to the basket and handle contact better would be a lot more efficient than it is now. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, you look at, um, you know, Matthew Della Vadova and he grew up playing a lot of footy and, and, you know, in the NBA, they, they reckon he's really physical, even though he doesn't look like a physical specimen, but the way he plays the game is physical. Damian Martin was a rugby league guy. So those guys, I think you make a good point about that physicality and being able to handle that and, um, you know, being able to play multiple sports is, is so important for uh, a player's development. Um, but, I, you know, I hadn't really heard well, that. Well, Delhi, that Delhi plays like he's playing footy, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. It's different. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. um, you know, and I think that's probably why he's successful. He's kind of found his niche where he can he can affect the game in, in a different way that other players can. So yeah, yeah I agree. I think that, that, I think that that uh, yeah. yeah, AFL transfers really well. Some of the like skills and coordination, but you know, I mean, I, I, guys that don't have the opportunity to do that, um, three x three is an avenue where you can learn to deal with that kind of physicality. Now, because you can't qualify automatically for the World Cup now by winning the Asia Cup, is there any other way you can get to the World Cup, or is it ne- is it now just not not a, not available? Yeah, well, the last time we qual- we qualified by going through the World Cup qualifier. Um, yeah. Now, three x three works a little different. The only reason we're not, I mean, a lot of the teams that are going to the Olympic qualifier, um, you know, we've beaten on several yeah. occasions, and but it's not it's not a uh, you know, it doesn't work like that. It works by participation and how much you play and how much you get involved, you know. So um, that's how the ranking points work. If you, obviously, um, when you host tournaments, you know, or when you have tournaments to your, you know, country and you have events, that boosts your ranking points. And, and you know, it works on, you know, if you advance further as a team and a player, if you advance further in the tournament, you get more points. Yeah, but the the hosting nation gets those points primarily, you know. So we haven't really been too involved or involved enough in the last couple of years to warrant the Olympic qualifier selection, even though we've done really well, uh, you know, on an individual level as a team. So it's really just how much you play. What really holds us back is that we don't send a team uh, to a thing like the World Tour, which is like, yeah. You know, the, the NBA of the 3X3, you know. So, um, that's what's really holding us back. We were, had early talks about, you know, putting a team of six guys together where we establish a base somewhere in Europe where we can kind of tag in and out every now and then. And, and, you know, something along those lines, we were looking at maybe setting up shop in, in near Amsterdam where they have this great facility. Mm-hmm. where we can train and stay, you know, two weeks in, two weeks out sort of thing, or four weeks in, two weeks out, where, you you know, you train and play and, and travel the world tour and then, you know, what, two goals tag in, another goal tag out just so you get a break sort of thing. Yeah. But, um, you know, that that obviously requires a lot of funding and, and requires money a bit. But if we really want to take this seriously, we need to be doing the world tour and a lot of that's in either Asia or uh, Europe. So how do these other countries fund that? Tim, is that is that from their national body or is it more private sponsorship? I guess I, I I don't really understand the whole funding of it. I guess from the other side of, do you know how that works? No, I wouldn't. I, I want to say that the country puts money in, and they and because, but the thing also is is that um, Australia, like obviously with uh, geography wise in Europe, you can drive to a tournament. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like if you're 
it's just they can compete because the, the travel is not too bad. Every time we'd have to go play a world tour, we're traveling like big plane flights, like long haul flights. Um, you know, then we're, it's just it's a little more difficult for us geographically to go and compete. But again, I think the funding that they provide is better. I think what, the way the teams are structured there is that yeah, there's prize money for winning certain things, but I think I think I, I heard that these guys paid a certain amount of money, and that prize money just kicks back to keep that going. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not certain on how exactly how the funding works, but um, I know it's a lot easier for countries in, in Europe and and even in Asia to fly short term and short short flights rather than Australia being so isolated and having to fly guys all around the world when we're not hosting big tournaments ourselves. Yeah, that uh, that is interesting. Well, hopefully, um, I you know, there's a lot of great great players out there that are excited about three on threes. Hopefully, Basketball Australia come to the, the party and uh, and keep that going and and give you guys a chance to really uh, make your mark yeah. on the stage. Because I mean, you you look at uh, the number of Australians playing in the NBA, and, and Australia has the talent to compete. It's just a matter. It sounds like a you know putting the right resources behind it to make it successful. So yeah. Exactly. Um, Moving on to your current situation there, Illawarra, what, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the news about what's going to happen with the club and, and all that. Where, where do you sit currently with, with everything there? Uh, well, I, I'm, um, I've pretty much heard what you guys have heard. Like if I, with the ownership stuff, um, what I've been told is that the Hawks are going through a liquidation process now in order to give them, uh, whoever the new owners may be as fresh a start as possible, not take on a whole bunch of debt. So we're going down that route now. And then the, in talks of ownership, there's a local guy here that, that was our naming rights sponsor for a number of years. His name's Tori Lavelle. He runs MCR. So in my mind, he, he seems like the right option to take an owner. He's a real, uh, he's an, he's never a local. He's a real family minded guy. And, and I'd love to see him. And he, he understands and chats with him that, you know, he wants to give. He's all about just giving the coaches and the players everything they need to be successful, you know. So, and then if you if you combine that with another conglomerate of owners, even if the ball camp has a share in that, I'm not sure how it's going to work. I don't know what the percentage percentages are going to be. I think it has the potential to be good, but I mean, you're always optimistic, you know. You know, it's just like the start of the season. You're always optimistic at the very start of the season when the record's zero zero. But once the once the feet hit the ground, you start getting through the daily grind, then problems start to come to the surface. And, you know, so whatever the management is, I just hope that it can be a smooth transition and the owners give the players and the, and the uh, coaches everything they need to be successful. And maybe also not try to influence things that the, the coaches are doing either. That might be, might be nice. You don't need to comment on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, are you contracted, though? Are you locked in for a contract? And on top of that, how, how seriously did you consider opting out once, I guess, you were forced to take the pay cut that everyone was across the league? Well, you know, I, um, I, uh, I'm i not contracted for next season, so I'm okay. um, oh, wow. I'm, wait, I'm waiting for every all the, you know, for the Hawks to work out where, my, where, where everything's at, who's coaching and all that, and before I, you know, I can get re-signed. So, sure. I mean, if that's, if that's even an option, I'm, and I'm in that period right now where I don't know if I'm going to be playing next year. I know I understand that's a possibility, mm. um, but you know, every year it happens when you come off contract, it starts, as you get older, it starts coming a little bit easier, a little bit less stressful because you set yourself up a little bit better. Do I want to play? 100%. I still feel like I've got uh, something, a lot left to give. You know, I don't feel, I, I physically, I feel probably the best I've felt my whole life. So it's um, it's not a question of um, if I can keep going. I know I can keep going. It's uh, whether the team's willing to invest in me or not. So that's really the, that's really the only factor in me playing because I'm ready to go. I'm still... I'm still training, you know, I'm still fit, I'm still, <laughs> still, uh, relatively, still been shooting the ball pretty well. I've set up a little thing in the backyard so I can get reps up. Yep. But, um, but apart from that, I'm, I'm ready to go. Well, there was nothing to suggest last season that you didn't have plenty left in the tank. And I can imagine this period as well where you've had time to freshen up the body if you needed to. I imagine these last four months where you've been able to freshen up, it's probably been good for you, both in terms of your body and to probably spend time with your, your young family. This has prob- probably been the best thing in the world. Like we've spoken to a couple of the other other new new dads like Cam Glidden on the show recently. This has been an amazing time to actually spend time at home with your family. Yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, I understand this, this has hit a lot of people fairly hard and um, sure. um, you know, I'm not... Uh, I'm not, you know, naive to that, but in terms of me individually, it's been a, a bit of, I was actually about to go play in Bendigo for, mm. for, in the off season. Um, 
you know, but unfortunately that didn't go ahead. But what has happened is that I've been able to spend a lot of time at home with my 16 month old son and uh, a lot of home with the wife and, and, you know, doing jobs around home improvements like I'm sure everyone else is doing. Yeah. Um, and it's been, you know, I've still been able to do some work with, uh, with my business, you know, but in like an open environment, one on one with uh, appropriate spacing, of course. <laughs> um, but, um, it's, uh, it's actually been quite refreshing to, to have this time for me, you know. Now, again, I understand it has not like that for everyone, and, I, and it's a bit of a pain, but you know, like I said, for me personally, it's, uh, it's actually been a bit of a blessing in disguise. And what is, I mean, off the, I mean, we know you as a basketball player, but off the court, what, um, what are your interests? What are you looking to do, uh, post basketball career? Uh, I've really, obviously, I've, I've been doing a bit of coaching like you have. You know, I've been doing the individuals um, and some group sessions, and I really enjoy coaching individuals one on one with kids. You know, it's um, uh, and I'm starting to transfer that into older kids now as well. So ideally, I, you know, I'd like to transition into assistant coaching after um, after my career is done. I really feel like I really feel like that's an area where I can excel, and I. You know, I've, I've got a lot to learn before I do that. You know, there's a lot of, uh, no, it's not just individual coaching, it's the doubting, it's, you know, it's, um, it's a n- number of things that come into coaching, you know, coaching on the fly, being a backup for the head coach, seeing things, you know, during the game. I know all that, but it's just, I feel like, you know, you want to do what you know. And, um, and basketball is something that I know fairly well. So I'd love to transition into that coaching uh, after I'm done. But, you know, I want to, I, I kind of want to leave on my own terms, so to speak. And I still feel like I've got a couple of seasons left in me before I, before I'm forced to do that. And, um, you know, I've also got a, the nutrition side of things. But if I'm honest with you, uh, if I could have chosen to be passionate about something else, I would have, because nutrition is a, a really, a really crappy industry to get into because it's, a uh, it's so opinionated and, um, I help as many people as I can, but you know the main thing of my business is basketball coaching, and that's really um, my passion. I wonder if there's a position you could almost create at a club where you do help with the nutrition of the players, plus be an assistant coach. <laughs> what I've what I've found over the, over the time is that guys don't really want to talk about <laughs> what they want to <laughs> okay. what they want to eat. I, that they're like don't mess with my food, man. You know yeah, okay. that's, that's um you know and uh, I I you know I. I when I first started, you know, you want that's all you want to talk about. You fall into a trap saying, No, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, but at the end of the day, the guys are gonna make their decisions and you know, and if they wanna to come to me for help they can, but I'm not gonna put it out there anymore. It's it's uh, it's up to them to come to me because um mm. you know, a lot but it's a very opinionated subject and yeah. and uh, I know the only reason I grew a passion for it is because without it I don't know if I'd still be playing. Like I, mm. I was I was at a point in my career where uh, my feet were getting were getting really bad. My knees were getting really bad, and I was only around 27, 28. Uh, I was taking a lot of painkillers to get through practice, and a lot of painkillers to, to you know prophylactically to get through games. And uh, it was only in passing that one of my mates, who was a who was a uh, owned a CrossFit gym at the time, said, "Hey, have you ever looked into nutrition?" So once I started looking into that and what it did for me and what the pains that it took away from me, it kind of it just started to develop a passion for me and I wanted to yeah, well. kind of spread that, yeah. Um, you mentioned before how you have to just wait and see if you get an offer from the Hawks or not before you, I guess, can decide if you are back at the club or not. Um, mm-hmm. Are you and the family willing to go go anywhere? If, if another club, Perth, Adelaide, Cairns, Brisbane, you know, whoever, Melbourne, would you be willing to go anywhere else to play? Is, is your family on board with that even if it is for, for a 12-month or six-month period? If the right situation arises, then yeah, I mean, me and my wife have chatted and said it has to be the right situation. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, she knows that I'm a basketball player, and that's what yeah. that's what I do. And um, you know, I still, like I said, I still feel like I've got a lot left to give. And I've never been, I've never been really one that's well motivated by by negativity. You know, like mm-hmm. if you don't perform, you're going to be cut. Sort of mentality. Yeah. I've always seen that if a team's willing to invest in me and and then that's all the positivity that I need. You know, that's the motivation that I need. I don't want to let someone down that's willing to invest in me, and I want to show them that I'm going to do everything in my, that I can to show that that investment was a wise decision. You know, and then that's always been the Hawks up until now because it's always just been the, the, the easy thing for the family, and they've been, you know, it's it's just worked out that way. Um, but, you know, is, is it, am I going to just let, uh, let my passion go just because the Hawks don't want to invest in me anymore and another team does? No, I'm going to, I'm going to go where, where the basketball is, you know, because that's, that's who I am and that's what I do. Um, so, you know, it's, it's never been a fact of, um, 
you know, as much as I want to say, yeah, just uh, hawks or nobody. Um, at the end of the day, I'm a basketball player, and you don't do this for very long. You don't get mm-hmm. to live this kind of lifestyle for very long in your career. And my wife's, uh, my wife's um, dad, uh, my father-in-law, he was actually a professional baseball player uh, in America, and um, okay. he he's always told me that no matter what it takes, just keep doing this as long as you can. Because when it's over, you're going to go to work and you're going to want to, you're going to go and you're going to look back at these days and really, you know, see that it's a, it's a one of a kind kind of lifestyle. So, you know, I, I just want to, I want to play as long as I can. Uh, that's my mentality towards it. I want to keep giving as much as I can until I feel like I can't give it anymore. It's amazing you say what motivates you as a player, I guess, from the way your coach deals with you and your team deals with you. Because if you had have gone to Cairns and played under Aaron Fern, he's famous for, I guess, the the negative approach in terms of <laughs> riding his plays incredibly hard. That, I don't think that would have worked for you, but if you have a look at Gordy McLeod and, and Bevo and now Matty Flynn, I guess you've had coaches at the Hawks who have motivated you in, in the right way, and, and that's why you perform for them. Yeah, look, oh, I've, had, I've had some great coaches, which has been great. Um, you know, I've, it's been, you know, Gordy is a, is a first year coach for me, was awesome, you know, and um, his, uh, his, his style at the time really, really suited our team. Um, and then when Bevo came in, he added that little bit more up tempo style that I think my game was headed towards anyway. So it was good timing. And um, and then where with Linny now, um, he's still trying to figure out what kind of coach he's going to be. I mean, you know, the first year of being a head coach, if you just get thrown in the deep end straight away. And I feel like if uh, he's always he, he's willing to learn, he's um, he's always trying to figure out ways to make himself better. Um, so if this first year, kind of similar to Mike Kelly last year, you know, mm. you, you, uh, you have a rough first season and then you come out, you establish, you know who you are, you know what to do, you know what not to do. You have more learning to do, of course. Yeah, you never stop learning. And, um, but you've got that first year out of the way and you really kind of need to establish who you are. And, and I'm hoping that's what, that's what if Flynn gets the, the coaching opportunity, I'm hoping that's what he's about to do. We talked about this the last year, Flinny's first year. And, you know, I think there was a, a lot of uh, different challenges that a first-year coach is, doesn't normally have, including having an 18-year-old starting point guard, LaMelo Ball. How, um, I guess, how did he fit into the team? How do you see his future playing out? Um, I guess just give us some, some inside look at, at what he was um, to, to the Hawks this year. Look, he, he definitely put us on the map. You know, you can't you can't fault him for that at all. Um, mm. His approach to the game was was actually really good. Gee, he was still in that Drew Lee kind of high school mode, where he would you know be scrimmaging and take some questionable shots. But as the season, as as practice and the season went on, what I what kind of impressed me most was his ability to learn and adjust. You know, he, he was he's an eighteen year old kid that was handed the reins of a professional team, so it's it's never going to be an easy an easy slog for him. But the way he had, he adapted and learned, considering he'd never played really any professional or organized basketball in the past to this level, I think as an 18-year-old kid, it, that's pretty exceptional. And, um, you know, a lot of people just look at it from the outside in and they see the highlights and they see stuff that he tried to do, but they don't realize that the grind that goes into a season, you know, they don't realize you've got other personalities on the team as well, you know. And one of the things that impressed me most about Lamelo was that the 18-year-old kid never got flopped. Not one time did he did he lose his cool. Like, if you look at all the things that people threw at him, like trash talk, all that sort of stuff, at practice, you know, never got flustered. He just he just took everything and kept moving forward. And for an eighteen year old kid, man, that's uh, that's, uh, that's quite impressive. Did you get a, a chance to, to interact with uh, Dad? Was he around at all? I didn't see a whole lot of clips, but yeah, I was just curious. Um, you know, I think he's, he's got a quite a reputation. No, look, I said uh, I said from the start because I I looked like. You know, when I heard that he was definitely coming, I, I just I knew that there was that was going to bring a lot of people that just want to taste that fame. They're just people that just want to latch on. They want to get in photos. They want to be around him so they can get a feel for that kind of fame. And, and I just said from day one, I didn't want to be that guy. I didn't want to be the guy to you know, oh, you know, here's me and Mello on Instagram. Or, you know, I'm like, I'm I'm 34. You're 18. We're not going to hang out. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, uh, we're different people. I'm going to have a relationship with you on the basketball court, and you know, I respect you as a person, obviously, and I respect what he does on the basketball court. But I was just going to try and give him piece of advice I could, um, but not in a team setting, just one-on-one. Like I just said from day one, I'm not 
I'm not going to try and use this as an opportunity for me to, to get out of the spotlight. I'm just going to continue to be me. And um, no, I didn't get a chance to. His dad came out, uh, visited a few times, but I didn't get a chance to um, to, uh, to chat or anything like that just because, like I said, I wasn't going to. I didn't want to just go out of my way to, I guess, try and get a bit of spotlight. You know, I just I just, I just said to myself I wasn't going to do that. You know what I mean? So I. Um, I just tried to give Mello everything I could on the basketball court, any piece of advice I could, um, not publicly, just just in his ear. But um, he's he's got a whole chapter ahead of him, and he he'll, he'll go on the NBA. One of the things that I will say, I don't think I've ever seen a better passer of the basketball. Some of the things that some of the passes that he tried in practice, and the ones that you saw in games, it's just that's a, a level of talent that you just don't see very often. You know, that's a, that's a feel for the game that you just have to develop, can't be taught. You know, so um. I think one time, the first time I really realized that I'm dealing with the different pieces here when he threw like a, he threw like an underarm spin pass to me in transition with one hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was surprised that he threw it. I, it you know, I just did what I do. I caught it and I got yeah. it and I realized from then that if I get in the right position, he's going to find me. So I was a very much a beneficiary of that. It was mm-hmm. unfortunate that he went down because we, me and him and even him and Booney as well really started to develop a really good chemistry. Yeah. Um, and pick and roll and, and he knew that I was going to spot up in transition and he would find me. He knew that Bernie was going to run the floor and he would hit him with those passes in transition. You know, it really started to start to click, but it's just really unfortunate that um, that he went down. Now, because you're talking talking here with Sean, it's impossible for me to not uh, ask you about the Perth Wildcats. I think every time you've made the playoffs, unfortunately, unfortunately it's been ended up losing to the Wildcats. Yeah. Does, <laughs> does even even me bringing up that name does it still make your skin crawl? What goes through your mind? Oh uh, look, man, I, John is what he what, is what he was, man. He was a competitor on the basketball floor, you know. Like uh, there's a lot of people like that, you know. He, he did what it took to win, and I think his record shows that he did what it took to win, you know. Like uh, yeah. you know, when you sit back in the moment, you think, yeah, man, I hate that guy, you know. Like <laughs> straight up, I knew that that was non mentality towards him, but it's because he was a winner. And because he did what it took to win. And as much as is, I mean, I've, I've spoken to uh, like, like Lishy and a few guys about Sean before. And one thing that does come up is that, you know, he's one of those guys that you had to play against, but you play with him, oh, that's got your back. And mm. for a player in my position now, it's hard enough to respect that as much as you hated it in the moment. Yeah, I think, and, I think and you did we, hate it, and you did hate it. Let me tell you. That. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing I, I I always admired about you, Tim, was you just seemed to. You rose to the moment. I think, you know, you always seem to always play well against against the Wildcats, especially in Perth. You know, I've seen a lot of guys over the career who kind of struggle in that environment. Did you... Yeah. Did you look forward to playing? And because you, see, I mean, if you were open in Perth Arena, which is now RAC Arena, the sh- I just knew the shot was going down. I knew whenever you subbed into the game, we had to know where where you were. were did you purposely enjoy that? You know, playing on the road, playing in in a in a hostile environment like that. Yeah, I love I love going to Perth. I mean, I I, I don't. I honestly, I I hate the Perth. I do because they've knocked me out every time. And they they've taken players from us before, you know. It's mm. it's, it's been a complete. I don't want to say take players. They they made their decisions. That's not what I mean. But I think that it's just every time I've gone to Perth, I just like I want to win so bad, but it's so damn hard to win there. You know what I mean? It's just that I've won I've won there once and once in my career, mm. and uh, and that that after that game, it was like we won the grand final. You know, <laughs> I've got a lot of respect. I've got a ton of respect for the organization and the way they do things. I speak to Mitch and Nick. You know about the differences when they went to Perth, and for them, like if I'm looking at them as friends, they'd made the smartest decision they could have. Because in terms of them as basketball players, they're going from a place in Illawarra where we don't have all the belts. You know what I mean? We don't we don't have everything that we need to make a player better. We just we just don't have that right now. We're working on it, and we're getting better at it. I think we are, but for them. At the time in their career to go to Perth, they're getting really good player development. They're getting everything they need in terms of facility and access. They're getting like you perks of being in Perth, like talking about you know meals and what have you. The way I think a good basketball organization runs, they give players everything they need to be successful. So at the end of the day, it's them that that the onus is on. It's up to you to go get better now. It's not that you didn't get this and we didn't get that. Oh, we can make excuses about that. Perth give the players from what I hear everything that they need to be successful. So it's up to them to go and do it. But having said that, how much would you like to, before your career finishes, beat them in a, in a playoff series? 
Oh, mate. Oh, oh, I love that more than anything else in the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I, I've, uh, as much as you are, uh, it's uh, similar like, like my attitude towards Sean is that did I hate playing against him? Hell yeah. But did I respect the fact that he was a winner? Of course I do. You can't mm. not. First winning record speaks for itself, you know, and uh, they, they have the organization and they've developed an organization that is able to bring in Bryce Cottons, that's able to bring in James Ennis's, that's able to bring in Casey Prakers, guys like this that are at a high level. And that's only good for the league and yeah, that's only going to boost us. Is it hard to play against those guys? Yeah, Casey Prather and Ennis gave me the business in, in a couple of playoff series, but at the end of the day, it's making the, the league better and they're setting a benchmark uh, for an organization that the other teams need to start trying to chase. How do you compare at the Hawks your rivalry with Perth just because of the fact that you played them in five playoff series during your career and the one with the Sydney Kings who are just down the road and they're the, I guess, seen as the big brothers. How do you compare those two, two rivalries for, from a Hawks point of view? Uh, well, I mean, the, the the Sydney one runs a lot deeper for the people of the city, obviously. Um, the first thing that I was told by a lot of people when I first came to, to, to Wollongong at the time was, um, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you beat Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, But then on a personal level, and, and because we met each other in the playoff uh, so many times in my career, that rivalry with Perth, for me, came a little bit more of a rivalry on a personal level. You know, I... I like like I was saying before. I never went to the big time schools. I never went to the, you know. I never really had didn't go to the AES or anything. I didn't go to a big D1 college. So I kind of see Perth as that thing that I never got. So I always want to play against them to the best of my ability. It's just one of those things that you always say as a competitor, you, you want to bring that every night. And that's what I'm trying to find. You know, that's one of the things that you realize after you play a few seasons that you can't take a night off. You just can't. Um, but and you've got to try and find the motivation to come at you know every team with the same mentality. But it was just something about playing against Perth that I just wanted to perform better and I wanted to win. And um, uh, like sitting back and looking at it now, it's just hard not to respect the fact that they've done what they've done. Well, I'll leave you. I appreciate the, the time. It's been a, a great insight for me. Whole another level of appreciation for you as, as a player, what you've been able to achieve. Last thing I just wanted to ask about, and you're probably a great person to, to speak to this, you know, you came in in 2009-10, the NBL was kind of just, just surviving at that at that point, and now we're sitting here 2020, you know, we've got LaMelo Ball, who might have been the number one, might be the number one draft pick coming up. How have you seen the league change from your time when you first came in to where you are now, especially on the talent side of things? It's, uh, it's taken a step up every year. Every, since I, like I said, I came in at the very bottom. I had the worst timing for my professional career. <laughs> but I, um, I came in right at the very bottom when the, I came in when the Hall to say, you know, they were, they played their last game at the Women's Payment Center the year before I got there. They said it was going to be their last game. And I'm so, sure the you know, whole we, league would even be happening. Exactly right. So I yeah. came in at the worst boss time and then to see it grow and grow and it, it, it took a while and then it was, I guess it was rising in popularity, you know, slightly in Australia. It was doing a pretty good job of, of getting, you know, popularity in Australia. And then I feel like the spike is when Larry Kessman came in and just to, took over from that point because once, I think once he got a hold of it, he did promote it and he did put the money into it that needed put into it. And now we're starting to see players really take this league seriously. And like in the past, I'm sure you know this as well, Sean, is that a lot of players would come in and just expect it to be a holiday and take their money and go, you know what I mean? And then they realize after a few games, this is not, you know, as much as I want to take the Corey Homicide quote, this is not a cupcake league, you know? <laughs> it's it's uh, A lot of guys would come in and just expect that, oh, this is Australia, this is going to be laid back, I'm just going to, you know, chill at the beach and get my get my points and get my money and go home. And, and I think a lot of guys were found out because that mentality is not going to get you anywhere here. Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a great point, and I think the thing a lot of people talk about with Kesselman coming in is that it just took the decision from say eight to nine clubs, and one person could actually make a decision that was going to be for the best of the league. You know, you weren't having a, a Perth and a Sydney and a Illawarra all having their different agendas, depending on who benefited the most from from each decision. So I think it's it's a great point that when Kesselman came in, we was able to take out a lot of the decision making and let's just move forward and try and make this as, as good as we can. And, and then just opening up and giving getting guys like Bogut to come back and Newley to come back from Europe. Some of those guys yeah. that we probably wouldn't have been able to that just brought a whole nother depth to the uh, the league as well. 
no, yeah, you're right. So I think who was able to, like you said, take it from those teams and just have one man with his vision of what it should be like. And he wanted to have that, like, the NBA connection. And now, man, M- NBL teams are going to play NBA teams. I would have never thought that was possible, you know, before. The, the way that he's kind of put it on the platform um, and put it on the world stage, I think I like, it's a testament to what he's done. At the end of the day, it's, it's a business and he's run it, you know, to the best, to probably the best anyone could have done, considering the exposure that it's in right now. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks for your time today, Tim. It's been uh, been a, a great insight to you, and I think um, you know you, you definitely have something to uh, to still offer someone out there. I hope uh, personally that it is for Illawarra because uh, you know you've been there, played over 300 games, only a third person to do it. So I'd love to see you, uh, you know, be able to finish out your career in a, in a club that you you've learned learned to love. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me as well. A massive thank you there to Tim Conrad for being so generous with his time here on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle, and I hope you all really enjoyed that chat. I, I, I've known Tim for, for that the whole NBL journey that he's been on, and it's been a remarkable one, 310 games that he's now played, all at the Illawarra Hawks. He's been to the grand final two times. He's now played for the Australian Boomers. He's played for Australia in 3x3 basketball, and he's put together a terrific career, and he couldn't be a better bloke, as I'm sure you picked up in that in that. Interview interview um also one of the best things about doing this show here hoops heavens basketball hustle with you sean is that you get to talk to people that you've only come to come to contact with on the basketball court they might not have the greatest thoughts on you as a as a competitor just because of the way you would get under people's skin but that's what made you such a great basketball player at the same time but this is a this is a hell of a chance for our listeners to get some insight into you speaking to people that you've never really spoken to but had some incredible battles with on the basketball court so i'm enjoying that side of this hopefully all of our listeners are too thanks to hoops heaven for continuing to bring this to us head to hoops7.com.au for all of your basketball gear and they'll continue to look after you and as they prepare to re-up in their shop now that the restrictions are beginning to be lifted they're doing some renovations and keep an eye out on their social media pages and we'll keep you updated as well for when they reopen it'll be a new look store and we'll encourage all of you to get along and support them because they've been our great supporter here at basketball hustle we'll continue to bring you these shows during the off season we've got another big show planned for next week where we catch up with New Zealand Breakers four-time championship winning big man, a New Zealand Tall Blacks regular, and now a Melbourne United centre average as of the past two seasons. He's now waiting to see where he'll be playing in this upcoming NBL season. Alex Pledge is the man that I'm talking about. It'll be tremendous to catch up with him as well. Another long-time opponent of you, Sean, obviously, so that's going to be another fascinating chat. And also, if all of our listeners want to put their minds together, have a think. Sean's been involved in the NBL for the last 15 years. Um, That's around the same amount of time that I've been working in the league in some capacity as well. So what we're going to do next episode is pick our all-import first and second teams from the last 15 years of the NBL. So the best imports that have played in the NBL, the best 10 of them, we'll put them into two teams and we'll announce that on our next episode. And hopefully some of our listeners want to send through their teams as well and we'll read out your teams on the show as well. So thanks again to Tim Conrad. Thank you for listening and thanks for supporting Hoop7's Basketball Hustle.